Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. So there's this video I want to tell you about. It's from a high-end Italian garment company called Loro Piana. And it's set to this ethereal music, and it shows this softly lit, dramatic footage of the Andes Mountains. The goal is to give an impression of how the company sources and processes its most valuable material, the wool of a wild, llama-like creature called the vicuña. You see them running free in the video. You hear the faint sound of hooves beating against dry mountain soil. And you see shots of indigenous communities who have lived with the vicuña since the days of the Incas. The company Loro Piana doesn't say anything in the video. In fact, there's no dialogue at all. And as my colleague Marcelo Rochebrun, Bloomberg's Lima bureau chief, told me, that's part of the company's appeal. What Loro Piana is known for is that they make what is now known as quiet luxury. That is, garments that are really expensive, really luxurious, but they don't necessarily look that shiny or they don't necessarily look that different than any other garment you might have. It's sort of a a very subtle, if you know, you know, this is very expensive. The brand is known for these kinds of understated, high-quality items. A pair of their cashmere sweatpants will run you about three grand. Kendall Roy wore a logoless Loro Piana baseball cap on the TV show Succession. And the sweaters they make from the wool of the galloping vicuñas in the video have price tags upwards of $9,000. But intertwined with its quiet luxury are the fates of some of the poorest communities in Peru. Vicuñas live very high. They can live at 12,000 feet. Indigenous communities that live in the Andes at 12,000 feet tend to be very poor. There has to be a big contrast here between the wealth of the people who live near vicuñas and the people who get to wear vicuña garments. What happens if I actually follow this connection? What would I find? Today on the show, an Italian fashion company, a once endangered South American species, a remote Andean community, and a plan that was supposed to help them all prosper. And why, 30 years later, it hasn't exactly worked out that way. I'm Sarah Holder, and this is The Big Take from Bloomberg News. Getting close enough to catch and shear a vicuña is not easy. They are way faster than a human. It's a process indigenous communities have been refining since the days of the Incan Empire. So indigenous communities will usually shear vicuñas once a year. And so they call this a chacu, which is a Quechua word that has been in use for centuries. Marcelo made the 10-hour trip from Lima to Lucanas, a town in the southern Andes, to see a chacu up close. We actually walked all these miles in this part of Peru, which is called Pampa Galeras, which is a national reserve dedicated to the vicuñas. And it is at about 12,000 feet. And it is really intense work to be able to walk miles and miles, closing in on vicuñas at this altitude. I don't know how easy it is to picture this, but it's a huge triangle with miles in length, and you carry a rope or a fence, and you start closing in on the animals. You are surrounding their territory from far away a distance enough that vicuñas will initially not realize that they are being encircled, but that is what that is what is happening. You're just making the circle or this triangle smaller and smaller as you go. So what you see is that as humans are walking in in one direction, the vicuñas are just running in the other, and there is and what's on the other side is a cage. So they will just walk into there and be trapped. And once they get to the cage, workers are waiting for them. I asked Marcelo whether he had touched a vicuña. I have touched a vicuña. I don't think the vicuña enjoyed it, but they are so soft. They're so fluffy. It feels like you're touching a cloud. Like, And, and I know that nobody knows what... Yeah, you cannot touch a cloud, but it's just... In my head, it's like the idea of what it would feel if you could touch a cloud. It takes a small group of people to shear a vicuña. One to grab the head and one to grab the legs. They take the vicuñas, lay them on their sides, and hold them down as someone else shears layers of their golden brown wool. Then, the workers flip the vicuña back up onto its feet. 
and it goes running off back into the wild, stunned and stressed, but otherwise unharmed. At the Chaku Marcelo attended, the man overseeing the shearing was Abraham Waman. He's been working with vicuñas in the community of Lucanas for almost 25 years. ¿Qué sientes cuando ves una vicuña? Well, for me, it's like a treasure, because sometimes an animal with wool runs the risk of poachers. In other places, for example, there are poachers who kill the vicuñas and take their wool. They take the skin and the wool. But an animal that is already sheared, that doesn't have any wool left, is basically a safe animal. In other words, a vicuña sheared is a vicuña saved. At one point, the animals were so heavily poached that the species was on the brink of extinction, and a bunch of Andean countries signed a treaty to protect them. That said two key things. One was it banned any trade of vicuña wool uh, for the foreseeable future until the species could recover somewhat. And then the other one was that it declared explicitly that vicuñas would be used economically for the benefit of the people of the Andes in the future when the, when the species had recovered. And it worked. By the 80s, the population had rebounded, and people started arguing that it was time to make the trade of Acuna wool legal again. One of those voices was the maker of the $9,000 sweater. And that's when Loropiana comes in, or at least when Loropiana comes in in the modern history of the, of the Vicuña, and they start to lobby the government, the Peruvian government, trying to find a way to get legal access to the Vicuña. Eventually, the government agreed. They brought back the sale of Acuna wool with some conditions. So only communities legally recognized by the government who share territory with vicuñas are able to capture and shear them. So a company like Loropiana has to go through an indigenous community. The indigenous community will shear the wool for free, and then Loropiana will buy that wool from the indigenous community, giving it significant cash for the economic progress of the place. The government ended up awarding one group of garment manufacturers legal access to vicuña wool. Loropiana wins this as part of a conglomerate that includes two other companies, but Loropiana is the, is the main one. And then Loropiana becomes the preeminent player in the new legal vicuña market. And in fact, the very first place where vicuñas were sheared legally once again in 1994 was in Lucanas, the community that we visited. That first newly legalized vicuña sharing was a big deal. Such a big deal that the president of Peru even attended. It marked the start of a promising new chapter in the history of Vicuña wool and the Andes. Under the new treaty, the Vicuña population was flourishing. The wool was creating a new source of income in Peru's poorest region. And Loro Piana had a monopoly on the world's most premium fiber. After the break, how it all fell apart. Leading up to the 1970s, vicuñas were on the brink of extinction. But a treaty signed by many of the Andean nations to pause the trade of their wool helped the population roar back to life. The trade in vicuña wool resumed in 1994, under provisions that the industry would be structured to benefit indigenous communities. But in 2000, the Peruvian government made a change that would let private companies cut indigenous communities out of the vicuña wool market. The change made it possible for any landowner— to shear the wool of a vicuña that set foot on their property. That meant companies could buy cheap land in the Andes and shear vicuñas without having to pay indigenous communities. This change was made in the year 2000 by a man called Alfonso Martinez. Alfonso Martinez was the head of the government office that was created to regulate the new vicuña wool market. And records show that behind the scenes, he lobbied hard for this change. And Alfonso Martinez goes on a few years later to become the CEO of Loropiana in Peru. After the change in regulation, and with Alfonso Martinez leading up their Peruvian operations, Loropiana bought about 5,000 acres of land in the Andes, near Lucanas. What that land enables you to do is you can put some vicuñas in there, and then you can fence the area. And this is allowed by Peruvian law, but it is a system that ensures that those vicuñas cannot leave your land and that they cannot be sheared by anybody else. And so Loropiana has records show about 2,000 vicuñas in this part of, of Peru that it shears every year. The records are public because they have to be filed with the wildlife regulator. 
And so Loropiana is able to get this Vicuña fiber without having to pay for it, either to an indigenous community or to anybody else. Does that fly in the face of the intent of the original treaty, which was supposed to allow indigenous communities to economically benefit from the vicuñas? Yeah, it definitely creates a competitor for the vicuña market. Indigenous communities used to have this source of revenue in the vicuña, but now it turns out that companies can go and get their own in a way. Like, the property of the vicuña is officially still in the hands of the state. You cannot have, you cannot own vicuñas. But what you have are rights to use the fur, the fiber that those animals have. And so now you have companies being able to shear that fiber because they, are, they have privately owned land and they have vicuñas in there. Loro Piana's permit to start shearing vicuñas on its own land was approved in 2010. And since then, it's been buying less vicuña wool from Lucanas and paying lower prices for what it does buy. All of this has meant less money for the community. Records show that in 2015, Loro Piana paid the community nearly $400,000 for vicuña wool. Seven years later, the company bought only $150,000 worth. Meanwhile, the prices Loro Piana charges for its vicuña garments, like the $9,000 sweaters and $33,000 coats, have only continued to climb. Marcelo asks Abraham Waman, the man leading the shearing in Lucanas, about how that gap feels. ¿Cómo te hace sentir tus propias condiciones de vida sabiendo quiénes son tus clientes? Sí, pues es un sentimiento, es un engaño. It's a deception, something we feel in this community and other communities. They buy it at a low price, but sell it at a higher price after transforming it into vicuña wool garments. Marcelo reached out to Laura Piana, and they said, quote, since it arrived in Peru in the 80s, Loro Piana has been committed to upholding the highest standards of ethical and responsible business practices. Loro Piana represents a key economic support locally, protecting and fortifying the demand and the value of the vicuña fiber, regardless of market dynamics. So is there another path here? Could the local community make money from the vicuña wool without working with existing brands? Why can't indigenous communities just process the wool they're shearing on their own and sell their own luxury garments? Yeah, that, that is one of the keys to the issue, right? And, and there are two problems here. One of them is just lack of access to resources. Spinning uh, vicuña fiber is not easy just because it is so fine. Um, indigenous communities are very good at weaving alpaca. They can weave llama. But in the case of the vicuña, it is both very fine and very short. The, the fibers themselves are not that long. So you need very expensive machinery that is not commonly available because vicuña is so rare. And then the second challenge is that even if an indigenous community could have access to this machinery, could make garments, it is hard to sell elite products that are worth thousands of dollars unless you have the right marketing, the right connection, the right reputation. I think this story about the vicuña is emblematic of a lot of struggles in countries like Peru and other countries in the global south about having raw materials, being the producer of important and expensive raw materials, but then not being able to capture the value of what those materials are worth when they are converted into something else. So has this treaty, the Vicuña Convention, worked? It is, it is, the, the treaty is still in place. The vicuña population has grown very significantly in recent years. Peru's last vicuña census was in 2012, and it had 200,000 vicuñas. So compare that to what it had in the 1950s and 60s, when the entire world population of vicuñas was 10,000. It, it has increased massively, so it is a successful case of the preservation of a species on the brink of extinction. But on the other hand, has it led to the progress of the people of the Andes? You cannot say that it has done very much. The Andes remain the poorest region in the entire country. And people are still working mostly as subsistence farmers. This is The Big Take from Bloomberg News. I'm Sarah Holder. This episode was produced by David Fox. It was edited by Caitlin Kenny and Daniel Ferrara, with additional support from Aaron Edwards. It was mixed by Ben O'Brien. It was fact-checked by Stacey Renee. Our senior producers are Naomi Shaven and Elizabeth Ponso. Nicole Beamsterbor is our executive producer. 
Sage Bauman is our head of podcasts. Special thanks to Julianne Wilkinson and Bianca Rosario Ramirez. Thanks for listening. Please follow and review The Big Take wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. We'll be back tomorrow. 